so it's it's time. It's um, ten thirty Pacific time, and uh, this is the panel on comparative classification. Um, I'm Joseph Bush, and I'll be the the moderator of this session. Um, we have a panel of experts um, who um, are uh, who who've met several times before the meeting today to talk about this topic and plan the discussion. Um, and um, we're going to have some brief presentations by uh, Joseph Tennis, who's um, at the University of Washington iSchool, um, followed by Mark Butler from, um, from Voice Inc., who's also an adjunct at, at uh, University of California, Berkeley. And then finally, Ada Slavic, who's the editor of the Universal Decimal Classification. Um, we're going to have these brief, uh, some brief presentations that each of um, the uh, panelists will make. And then we'll take a brief break um, for about five minutes and then come back and have a, uh, a discussion. So um, we um, um, really welcome um, uh, participants to um, put um, thoughts in the chat or raise their hand and we'll um, um, let them um, uh, turn on their microphone and let them speak. And um, we, we want at least half of the, uh, the session or a part of the session to be uh, spent in, in discussion in the second half. So um, yeah, and, uh, roughly I have about uh, 40 minutes for the presentations, a little break, and then 40 minutes for the uh, for the discussion. So I will get out of the way, and um, and I will let uh, Joe Tennis uh, take control of or share his screen. Great, thanks, Joseph. Let's see, share screen. There we go. Great. Well, welcome everyone. It's great to see everyone in the room. Um, uh, thank you for being here. I'll make my comments brief. I'm the generalist uh, here in a way, and we'll have more specific conversation um, as we go through. Um, first, I want to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you from the lands of the Coast Salish people. Um, second, I'd like to thank uh, Joseph Bush for putting this panel together. Thank you very much. And third, I want to acknowledge the depth of expertise in this room, and I hope that what I'm offering can be of some use, um, if not just to start conversation. So I'm coming to this topic of comparative classification um, in the spirit of Max Mueller, um, who didn't say this exact quote, but is in the spirit of, to know one language is to know none. That is, if you don't study other languages, you don't understand language itself. The same thing can happen in classification. If you are only conversant in one area of classification, not comparing them, I feel that there's a, there, you're losing out on a lot of learning. And why then? So we compare to understand the internal workings and contextual factors that make classification what it is and how it works. These are constructs. We built these things for a particular purpose. And by comparing, we understand what those things are and how they work. Um, this is essential for us to understand whether we are building, um, and this is essential for us to understand because we want to know whether we're building good and useful classification schemes, good or useful classification schemes. Um, the internal workings of the scheme, in my mind, are its semantics and its structure. Um, the contextual factors include the technological context, time, culture, the purpose for which it was built, um, and the use, which may be different from the purpose um, of, of, of how it's being used. And that's just among many other contextual factors we can discuss. For me, I think there are three major basic kinds of comparison available to us. Um, we can compare over time, um, which I've spent a lot of my uh, career doing. Um, we can compare two or more schemes at the same point in time for multiple reasons. Um, and then I think we can compare a scheme as it's been repurposed. And I'll talk more about this um, uh, and when I get to that section on what that means to me. Um, and just to note, these can be combined. They're, these are not mutually exclusive uh, things, and we can do them uh, together or in any kind of combination. 
Now, I've said this particular thing elsewhere um, as part of my conception of what I consider second order classification theory. Uh, first order classification theory to me is how do you build a scheme? Uh, so what are the things we need to build um, a useful or good classification? And second order is what do we do once it's built? Um, what do we do with this as time goes on? What do we do with it when we need to have it interact with other kinds of systems and contexts, etc. So what about scheme change over time? Um, an example here might be that we look at how a particular subject is handled uh, in an individual scheme over time. Uh, for example, eugenics used to be considered a biological science in the Dewey Decimal Classification. Um, there are still libraries that have it housed, have books housed in that particular set of 500s um, to this day. It's hard to reclass with physical stuff. Digital stuff changes the game. Gypsies, nomads, and outcast races were in what I consider an other class in DDC because before the editors uh, separated geopolitical divisions and language and race and ethnicity, there was no place for these people. So there was this conception as to how it was supposed, to, how we were supposed to see the world um, through this particular um, subject. And schemes can perpetuate bias and system, systemic discrimination as well, as documented by many people, including Molly Higgins, uh, who looked at Asian Americans as a class in Dewey. Um, We've learned a lot from this comparison. We've learned that um, they're, uh, they're, that su subjects can persist, um, but we kind of have to interrogate how they persist um, through subject ontogeny. Um, we've learned that we need to care for what, the integrity of the collocation factor of classification over time. The purpose of, of what the classification is to collocate uh, kinds of literatures um, and resources. And if we evolve in various ways, our ability to co-locate may be uh, jeopardized. Um, we've also learned quite by accident that there, the practitioners know very well of something that I call semantic gravity. That is, even though a scheme may evolve, um, we may still be using outdated class numbers because our collection is already classed using those outdated class numbers and we're not gonna go back and reclass. Uh, and some interesting challenges that have surfaced in this context is now that we have, um, Hattie Trust and amazing resources um, on, of literature, we can compare actually how language evolves and moves in natural language um, and in the scholarly literature, et cetera, to our artificial languages, our classification schemes, um, and ask questions about how good they are in those contexts. Um, we can also compare two or more schemes. Um, there's an ideal type comparison um, and a comparison in order to interoperate or convert or integrate. There's lots of words for this um, particular activity that we engage in. Um, you know, they are, if we want to look at more than one scheme and against an ideal type, um, we might ask questions like how rigid, how resilient, or how parsimonious the scheme is. And this is a very old school comparison. Um, Ranganathan was very much interested in showing how good freely faceted classification schemes were along these lines. And so he constructed these evaluation mechanisms to compare enumerative schemes, partially enumerative, partially faceted, rigidly faceted and freely faceted classification schemes in the 1960s. Um, and I think some of this is valid today, some of it's not, but that's kind of an idea which you get about uh, how we might compare against ideal types. Um, and then there's also this user um, conception of what a classification scheme should be doing. And we've got um, documented literature. This is a three page review of the Dewey Decimal Classification by a librarian in 1923. I'm going to share the screen so that you can have this. This comes from the Columbia Archives. Um, Dewey was not happy about this particular um, review, um, but it goes on and on about how the classification scheme failed to meet the ideal type um, at that particular time, which has its own technological and conceptual context, as you can imagine. Um, and then there's the comparison for interoperation. And I want to compare what I'm going to say with uh, Marsha Zhang. I'm delighted that you're in the room, Marsha. Um, I want to engage uh, with, in conversation with you about some of the things that I've put in here. Um, so this is both um, yeah, for comparison for interoperation. We want to look both at semantics and structure um, as they're examined in general. And then there are various ways to uh, interoperate um, as, as documented in the 2016 encyclopedia article by Marsha. Um, but I think there's two kinds of interoperation. There's sort of a direct scheme to scheme interoperation where we can map, um, and that's a kind of comparison that we do. Um, Marsha talked uh, about uh, derivation as well. And I asterisk that because that 
challenges my definition of interoperation. So I'd like to talk with you more about that, Marsha. Um, intermediary tools um, are abundant and they are called many different names. Um, but from the 80s, we have switching languages from Lancaster. Um, uh, in the 70s, we have super schemes, which are sort of like upper level ontologies today, we might call them. Um, and then universal sources, core ontologies, and there's a whole, more, whole bunch more uh, listed in, in the Zhang article as well. Now, for repurposes and reengineering, um, this is when we're taking a classification scheme, transforming it sort of, either by intention or technologically or some other structural way, and then asking the question about the original versus the reimagined one. And so the techno uh, structure, re uh, techno structure reengineering is what I'm calling um, the wave of, of development that was happening in the early aughts with the semantic web, where we're wrapping um, semantic web uh, technologies and constructs around pre-semantic web schemes. Um, and so Sorgal has written on that among many other people. Um, and then another thing we can do is say, uh, and this is a tried and true tradition in libraries of doing collection assessment. Um, how much do you have in this class? Um, what that does for the classification or the classifiers in the room is say, well, is this the right class? Are you asking the right questions for this? And so we learn a little bit about our classification scheme by lining up with the resources we think are in that class. So in both of these cases, we compare by reimagining the purpose of the scheme and from there interrogate the original intent beside the reimagined one. So I'll close by saying comparing classification opens our eyes to our assumptions about the mechanics and motivations of our knowledge organization work. And I look forward to further conversation on the topic. Um, my, UR, my URL is at that QR code, um, and I know that the slides will be shared. So thank you very much. Thanks, Joe. That's fantastic. A great, a great baseline for um, for us to think about. And um, when we have our our meeting on Friday, Dagobert will be on the on the call too. So you can you can um, you'll have Marsha and Dagobert. <laughs> So I have a number of the players. So Mark, um, do you want to take over? You're on mute too. Thank you. No problem. Uh, okay, let me put this in the share mode. Okay, great. Um, so I come at this from a somewhat different perspective as a um, as somebody who actually builds automated classifiers that use or abuse these classification schemes in order to essentially create um, metadata that is used for downstream processes like organizing, finding, searching, and so on. So Joseph, um, in putting this together, basically talked about two different approaches to this. One was examining scheme change over time, and the other was looking at comparing various schemes that cover the same domain. And so actually, number two is a better fit for a problem that I um, have, to, have to deal with, which is I'm looking to organize some content. How can I find a good classification scheme in order to do that and do that in an automated um, or semi-automated uh, fashion? So my goal here is really just to begin asking some questions about this. I don't purport to have the answer. Um, I don't think that anybody has the answer. And so, uh, yes, just starting to ask some questions. Um, so if we're comparing schemes, how can we go about uh, doing that? So one possibility is, as Joe was saying, we have um, crosswalks available that allow us to compare two schemes and to map one scheme to another. Um, so this allows us to both compare them lexically, which is we can look at how the vocabulary in one 
maps to the vocabulary in another. We can also look at them semantically. So assuming that the classification has both a vocabulary and some set of relations, we can look at um, term relation term triples and make a comparison on that basis. And we can also expand that a little bit to look at the context of the neighbors um, in order to see how terms map. So my question would be, if we're actually comparing two schemes, is mapping sufficient? Is that all that we need to do? Um, and I would argue, no, we need to do much more than that to make an accurate comparison. So as I said, I'm a user of um, classification schemes. I build uh, predictive models that take classification, existing classification schemes and use them to organize some content that I am um, dealing with. And so in doing that, I need to find a good classification or part of a classification in order to be able to organize the content that I am dealing with. So some of the questions that I face in doing this is how do I select the appropriate scheme? Um, what are the set of schemes that are available to me? How can I compare two schemes so that I can get the best scheme for my, um, for my purposes? And how do I know that I'm using the scheme as it was intended? Now, I may not end up wanting to use it as it was intended. I may purposely abuse it, but nonetheless, I would like to know what is the correct way of of using this or how was it intended to um, be used and what was it originally designed to do. So I really want the ability to compare these schemes so that I can pick the best one for the job that um, I'm facing. So how can how can we do that? Um, so there's a bunch of possible criteria for looking at this and um, Sorry, there's a bunch of criteria for looking at this. This is an incomplete list. Um, and so part of my question is, what are the criteria that might matter in making this comparison and in choosing a particular scheme? Obviously, we have the vocabulary and its relations. These are the buckets into which I'm going to categorize things. We have, what are the subdomains? I may not want the whole domain, so I, have done things with medical classifications where I don't want the entire domain. I want just a branch. That's what I'm going to work with. Um, what were the intended uses of this classification scheme? Who created it? And who are the users right now? So since I come at this from a perspective of natural language processing and ethical AI, one of the things that I've encountered that I think can potentially help to create a framework for answering these questions and for doing this comparison is um, something that was developed in the ethical AI uh, and the NLP community to deal with issues around um, these kind of comparisons and understanding uh, the capabilities of models and data is this idea of model cards and data cards. So these are basically structured entities that describe how a model or data set was built, um, how the data is used in training the model, how the model can be evaluated, um, how the model's use affects real people. So part of this came out of a researcher at MIT who was working with facial recognition and noticed that her face was not being recognized. It ends up being a combination of partly the algorithm, but mostly the underlying data. Um, and so we need to um, we need to take that into account, and these model cards and data cards are a structured way of doing that. So the model cards and data cards are um, available from Google. They're also available in um, other open source uh, repositories. 
And so what are some of the things that they do? They identify um, the intended uses, the potential limitations, very important. Uh, they also identify how the model or the data was created, um, what are known gaps in the coverage, and also how it can be available, uh, how it could be evaluated. Uh, two examples of this, so a model card at um, Hugging Face. Hugging Face is a um, open source uh, machine learning library where they have, uh, in addition to Google, um, have a large collection of pre-trained models that are available for anyone to come along and use. And so it's important that you understand kind of what, what are the capabilities of the model, how was the model trained, how can it be used, what's going to work, what isn't going to work, and how can you um, evaluate that. And so this is basically presented as a structured set of criteria, right? Pretty much like a metadata record for the models and for the data sets. You can see here with the data set that they have a pretty rich set of attributes, and that is what is of interest to me. If we're going to compare classifications, perhaps we need a set of attributes, not unlike this, not necessarily this set, but a set of attributes related to um, classification that would give us these points of, um, of comparison. So my question is, or my starting question is, could we develop a framework that's similar to model cards or data cards that we could use to identify the criteria that would um, matter in coming up with this standardized description? Some examples of these attributes. So here's the attributes in the model card, again, pretty rich set of attributes, not necessarily um, applying to classification, but some of them would. The, the details, for instance, um, would be something that would apply, or also the um, intended use and uh, users. So what I have here is just a quick set of some of these possible um, criteria for comparison. So one obviously is structure. Uh, what kind of structure is being used? Uh, another would be what was the method of construction? So how was this classification scheme put together? And importantly, what were the sources used for developing the scheme? Um, the Knowing the sources may help to identify possible gaps in the uh, coverage. I also want to know, is this classification being actively maintained? Um, and if not, uh, I am curious to know how it's been taken up and used by um, others so that I have a sense of drift. Um, and I care about this because I have a classification scheme that is operating in a dynamic world where everything is moving and I want to be able to um, take that into account. Uh, another important criteria is stakeholders. So who were the creators of this um, classification scheme? Who were the funders of the classification scheme? Again, this is something that can give me a sense of the, um, let's call it the point of view of the classification. Uh, I'd also like to know who has used it, um, what kind of systems were you were enabled using this classification scheme. And so this is where I come in. I am sort of a second order user uh, second order consumer of these classification schemes. I'm not creating the classification scheme. I'm not maintaining it. I am either using it in a system or using it um, as part of a system and thus the, the second um, order use. So I very much care about the stakeholders and I care about the intended uses, the actual uses, and also process of the processes of interpretation that um, interact with the scheme, the uses, and the um, users. Finally, um, I'm interested in was this classification 
built to actually facilitate classification. I think of this as putting things into buckets. That's essentially what I'm training my model to do. Um, or was it built for interoperability and interacting with other schemes? And finally, um, Coming from ethical AI, I am perhaps more sensitive to the biases that are contained in the language and that therefore get carried over into these automated systems. So you have to pay attention to this, otherwise you will be, um, you will be bitten. Uh, and so I want to be able to understand what kind of biases were um, can we identify in the construction of this? What kind of biases can we identify in the application of the classification scheme? Joe gave a couple of great examples of that with um, eugenics and gypsies and nomadic peoples. And also, um, what kind of biases have been discovered in, its, in the subsequent use of this classification scheme? So again, my interest is not in, not in being prescriptive, but rather in beginning a conversation to try and, try and identify some of the criteria that will matter in making comparisons between these um, classification schemes and studying their differences and similarities. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. That was that was great. Lots of lots of stuff to think about here. Um, and um, so in our third presentation is from um, is from Ada, who again is going to be talking about um, practical application from the ground level um, working with um, with a scheme. So Ada, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, yeah. hear you loud and clear. And see my slide and see your slides. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you very much for this opportunity to talk about intricacies of an old, uh, mature, long living classification system. Although I'll be talking about UDC, many of these things are, um, are challenges that I mentioned are already um, set nicely by uh, and announced nicely by Joe and uh, it, this will be also of interest to Mark and I spent uh, some time explain, explaining more a uh, structure of classification just for the reason for this reason for the reason of my panelists pointing out to issues with um, structural uh, uh, um, in kind of structural features of classification system. So when we're talking about UDC, we take 1905 as being the start, the first edition of the Universal Decimal Classification. In the period of 80 years, it was developed as an international system printed in hundreds of um, print, uh, editions in different countries as full or medium or bridged edition. And at the end of 1980s, at that period, it reached over 200,000 classes, and the owner of classification of an international institution for documentation, Federation for Documentation, or FID, has decided that classification was unmanageable in that size and that they need, in order to continue and make it sustainable, they reduced the classification to what was previously medium edition. They entered it into database, um, and this UDC mass reference file has become, since then, a standard classification. Uh, and since 1993, we had 21 editions or releases or changes in classification. In this period, they, um, they were about 40% of classification was approximately revised. And there are, in this database, there are also 15 classes, uh, 15,000 classes of canceled or deprecated um, uh, UDC notations. So we can see that uh, in a long period of 120 years, you can observe both growth and decrease of classification. And each of those comes with challenges. And then we have this big problem of printed editions that are not digitized and that make analysis and comparison over time rather difficult. From 1993, uh, when we have this classification of the database, everything becomes much easier. We have data supporting changes, monitoring them and distributing and publishing them. Uh, so 
the context of, class, of bibliographic classification is very important. These are bibliographic classifications are complex knowledge organization system. We can best think of them as a collection of hierarchies organizing a broader facet uh, within knowledge domain and this broader facet has sub facets and series and series of hierarchies. And then each of these classes or concept has notation attached to it, which we say it's a language independent. We can refer to it as a terms, albeit artificial. And then we have a set of syntax rules by which these uh, what we call tables can be combined uh, and to um, express more specific uh, subject areas. Specific to UDC is this blue area, this 16, almost 16,000 of common isolate as uh, Ranganathan termed them, or as we call them common auxiliary concepts that do not belong to any of these main disciplines and knowledge classes that are now almost 60,000 of them. And so these facets of time, ethnic place, form, and language about which we are going um, to, on, on which we are going to spend more time today are these interesting um, hierarchies. These are clear taxonomies and lang language is one of these uh, pure taxonomies that is interesting to observe. This structure of classification is a, from the very beginning of the inception of the UDC. So um, Paul Otlet Lafontaine needed a classification system to organize uh, a huge bibliography they have just started, uh, which was called Universal Bibliographic Repertory. And they approached Dewey and got permission from him to use Dewey as the basis uh, and with one proviso that first three level of classification should not be changed. And then they um, started thinking about separating, they basically decomposed the theory and created this system which has this uh, main tables and main, main knowledge area and these facets. And then they invented this way of combining, in this case, relation between art and uh, uh, literature in France in 18th century, which happens to be um, conference proceedings in Italian language. So this is a kind of uh, system they have created. And from the very outset, they needed to expand because Dewey at that time was a small classification designed for American libraries. So they started as they proceeded, they started in, 1980, in 1899. You can see these booklets. The first one is physics. You can see already that it has UDC number on it. And interestingly enough, this UDC number is still today. This means decimal classification of physics in relation to physics. So this is classification of physics. Then they developed photography. Uh, then you can see sport here. And then these booklets are very fragile. They are not digitized. You can barely open them or photograph them. Um, the kind of paper <laughs> is falling apart. So unfortunately, this is as far as we can go into analysis. Sorry about that. And then these little booklets were published as a, this first edition that you can see on the table in front of this huge catalog, which is this universal bibliographic repertory, which at the beginning uh, of the First World War had 15 million records. And um, this book then served to index these entries in the bibliography and to retrieve them. And in this um, booklet, the language table consists of this short brief I, I'm showing here in English. So you can see a very illogical structure. You can see that the focus is on uh, Western or European languages that are likely to be of interest in American libraries. You can see that English is the top and most important languages had the shortest notation and most practical notation to be used. And then you can see that all other languages, including Slavonic or Slavic languages, are in other languages. And so why don't we change that? What is the problem with this? So this is what the problem is. Language facet in UDC and in many other classification has a multiple function. First of all, this is a list, this is a taxonomy of all languages grouped in the language in some kind of language fa uh, families. Each of these languages, the language family has a notation and that notation in UDC is preceded with the sign equal, which we call facet indicators. And every time you see something starting with equal, it has something to do with language. 
And these numbers from these tables are first can be used to indicate that document is written in certain language. So you can say physics and then you can attach language, in this case English, and that means that this book on physics is in English. The second use is creation of ethnic groupings and people. You can take any language from this table that today has uh, 1,800 subdivisions, which list many, many languages. And then you can surround it with parentheses and you have changed the meaning. This has suddenly become uh, people, ethnic grouping, Kurdish people. The third function is that in the linguistics, in the philology of languages, we do not list these languages again. There is only instruction that says whenever you need language as a subject of study, where the book is about a certain language, you take a language from this table above, you remove this equal sign and you amalgamate, you combine it with the main number for linguistics and exactly the same with literature. So the consequence of this, this uh, principle in is called parallel division or parallel, parallel derivation. This means that schedules become shorter, classification of languages appears only once, and then in these places when you come in other, other part of schedules there is nothing, it's basically empty. And it just has a couple of examples to show you how you can express uh, philology of a language or, or fiction literature in a certain language. And so the impact of this is that and the, every little changes in this table of la languages has a, a major impact on other areas of classification. But most importantly, these areas of classification, such as linguistic and literature, are very frequently used in libraries. Um, the large, pro large proportion, especially, especially in public and school libraries of uh, collections, are actually literature fiction that kind of thing, 60 to 7% in some public libraries. So you have this problem. Every time you touch this above, you affect the use of that classification. Um, I think both um, Joe and Mark mentioned the issues with this. And for that reason, every revision of languages is very, very carefully uh, considered. And there are only a few major restructuring on this horrible first table that you just saw. And so this is that Western bias, this, this illogical structure of languages that came into um, UDC and part of it is still relevant and can be seen in Dewey. And you can see this Greek that this top of the classification, the most valuable notation on the very top of classification is are wasted on a single languages or that um, very small language group, Romance languages occupies three top positions. And also how, how did they continue with this? So in this from 1986, 1920 onwards, there is huge proliferation of UDC edition. There's a huge amount of schedules and one of the biggest and most important schedules in the history of UDC is the German full edition from 1930s that has a very detailed classification of languages. But what did they do? They had to do this all this development under this uh, totally silly structure. So they with a very few touches. So what they managed to do, they removed uh, Greek to free class eight, they removed Greek to seven together. So they are changing the meaning of this number for everyone, including libraries using this number, using eight for Greek, <coughs> pardon, for Greek. And then they did a bit of a tidying uh, on the top level to make it more logical. And then this problem continues and the criticism of classification continues and continues. And there is a huge pushback from the user community not to touch languages, not to do changes. And uh, at the end, Central Classification Committee has decided this is absolutely enough, that this is now has become completely impossible because if top is wrong, then there is very little that you can do deep, deep down in the hierarchy. So you, you are logically finishing with merging languages that don't belong together together. So they did a huge 
reclassification in 1990s that completely restructured languages based on the principle of geneal geneal genealogy, diachronic relatedness of languages from linguistic theory. So this is what you see here is how languages look today, how this awkward structure is now changed. You can also observe that descriptions are complex. They are now represented on the top level. We are now observing only top level of classification. We don't see what is under, but you can observe that this is now, that these are now large groups that you can see that artificial languages has appeared here at the bottom. You cannot see English language anymore here. So you can much deeper structure um, removed Western bias, so everything is very positive. Apart from the fact that this restructuring of the languages was based on the theory and research in linguistics that was done, that was published in 1960s, 1970s, 1980s. And what happened is that from 1990s onwards, there was a huge development in linguistics in uh, study of indigenous languages. People were, you could approach these people more. Many tribes were discovered as Amazon. You had better way of recording. You had better methodology of following, comparing morphological and phonetical features of languages. And they, the whole situation with indigenous languages, in particular South American language, which is the richest um, area, language area in the world, in the entire world, and this was completely neg neglected so far in the classification of languages previously. So now we had a situation that even if we are happy with this, what we had in the 1990s, we have to look into these um, newly studied areas. And in 2008, we have approached reclassification of American indigenous languages um, that both North and South and then African languages. And we have now continued looking into Pacific uh, Austronesian Australian languages and hopefully in the next edition will have them revised. The changes that you can observe that are not structured is also in the text and description of these classes. So you have see, you see prevalence of um, vernacular naming as opposed to those given by colonial forces to the certain, you can see removal of pejorative uh, uh, terms in African languages and South American languages. You can see that some classes have to stay, some grouping, although they're scientifically obsolete, but you provide some context and then you provide some um, notes that help in this ambiguation of languages. So when I said that there are 1,800 of subdivision, you can see, if you compare this with ethnologue database, which claims something about 6,000 languages, what they mean is these 6,000 each individual of these. And classification such as UGC works with grouping. So we have this dial, um, dialect continuums and stuff in you know, listed many languages within one class. This is just to give you an idea how it looks inside. When you look into what is actually happening from the beginning to date, <clears throat> what is happening in terms of parsimony that Joe mentioned, the length of classification, as soon as you start to have a logical structure, you have to have a deeper hierarchy. If your notation, the one use is, you use to represent class is hierarchically expressive, that automatically means that you have longer numbers that each language, the deeper in the hierarchy you go, these numbers become more, the longer, longer and longer. And if you look how this looks in one of these South American languages that survived two big restructuring or three, we may say, <clears throat> we can see that in the beginning the Quechuan languages, which is a huge family, was not even mentioned. It is all grouped into South American languages. Then it appears suddenly in this German edition under South Amerindian, languages just as such as one language and gets this number. <clears throat> then in the big reclassification, it was assigned in the group of Andean and Equatorial languages. And here it got a six digit number because this is how it falls into this hierarchy. And then when this is now revised, in order not to override these numbers, the whole new structure was built on equal 85. So the same language walked from 1930s, from 
equal 98 to equal 87 to equal 85. And then within that class, you can see um, these four uh, groups of languages, how Quechuan languages and grouping of languages look like at the moment. So you can see that this moving from this structure to this structure here enables and separates in Andean languages and equatorial languages to separate coordinated hierarchies, enabled now classification notation to be slightly smaller and more logical. So this is also one goal of this huge uh, perturbation of languages. So in summary, I will just point to these things that structural change in moving concepts from one class to another, from one notation to another notation is extremely disruptive. Uh, the broader the class, the greater the problems it, it creates in collection. This is why I was just showing you the tops, because these changes in the tops actually pull out hundreds of languages underneath and hundreds of literatures and hundreds of people that are supposed to be classed underneath. So the logical, this logical structure re require this deeper hierarchy, which absolutely hated by users. And, you know, and this is obviously the reason why you push back and why Dewey doesn't do this um, change. And he still has this uh, a clear Western bias because of this problem that, you know, you are causing this disruption. And once you do this, libraries very ra rarely and reluctantly update classification. So there are many libraries nowadays that are still using the old uh, UDC classification. So when you are comparing, you have to be aware what you're comparing. While we all work on this changing of description, we can tidy, we can kind of this easy things, changing text, changing description, changing name on the language, removing biases in name, that is easy things. So I would just, I'm not going into the area, this is my final slide, I'm not going to explain uh, the way how we maintain in the database how this is recorded. What I want to say that everything is about data. So if you don't, this or don't have this old uh, printed edition available, digitized, and if you cannot process them and you know, operate on them and link and do something with them, you are losing a whole wealth of this um, richness of the cultural changes, what happens, which is usually of interest to researchers. But most importantly, you are losing possibility, in, even if you publish linked data, and everything is obviously and there, the collections that are using obsolete numbers, if these obsolete numbers are not now published in, in your namespace, um, they're getting lost. So thank you very much. I'm sorry if I overran a bit. No, no problem at all. Thank you, Ada, uh, very much. And um, we'll end the session there. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you thank all. You. Thank you. Bye now.